Mike from Grape Expectations. I uh, wish you were here with us today, but uh, we're going to be crushing your grapes today, Steve. And just so you know, we've been saving stems for you all day long to come and pick up for your compost. Um, you're making a wonderful blend here. <laughs> we got a uh, South African Cab, a Chilean Cab, Chilean Merlot, Carmenere, Cab Franc, and Malbec. It's going to take 42 18 pound crates to produce your barrel of wine. We have 756 pounds of grapes sitting behind me here. Which we will be dumping into the crusher distimmer. This is a crusher distimmer. It's basically going to separate the, the grape. The stems are going to come out one end. The grapes are going to be coming out the other end into the tub, the fermentation vat. Um, once the fermentation vat is full, we're going to send you over to Mr. K.J. Howe, a.k.a. The Professor. Um, he's going to give you a fermentation class, talk about how to make alcohol, tell you a few jokes, keep it light, keep it fun. Um, so we miss you guys and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Here we go. things that you try to determine uh, when you are making wine is the amount of sugar that's in the grapes which converts into the alcohol that, by volume that your wine was going to attain. And you do that by using a refractometer, taking a sample of the must, M-U-S-T, that's what this is called, must, and you can see that they would just come out of the uh, crusher the stemmer. And I'm going to go in and get a little sample and I'm going to make sure I just have the juice. Yeah, it is a little juice. It's all you need is a little bit. And then I'm going to use a refractometer. And I'm going to put it right on there like that. And I'm going to look up to the sky. And there's a reading. And it's, a, it's from 0 to like uh, oh, 40. And we're right now, we're at 26. 26 is the bricks, the amount of sugar that's in that sample, which is going to equate to the alcohol by volume your wine will be if the yeast eats all the sugar and the musk gets gone to completion. Okay, so in this case, it's about, uh, let's see what they say, 26. You divide it by two, you add 0.5, and you get 13.5% alcohol. That's what this wine will be, uh, alcohol by volume, and we put that on the tape right on the, on the side of the uh, of the uh, uh, nomenclature that's on there with, with the recipe. The recipe is written right on the uh, bow. This is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon from South Africa, 
and we bring grapes in from Chile, South America, and from South Africa in May, which is the Southern Hemisphere, that's their fall. So we have year-round production here at, uh, at the Great Expectations. Now, <laughs> now that we know that the, uh, what the uh, bricks is, we're going to write it right on the side so we keep track. And I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put right down here. I'm also going to put it on the top because sometimes you get the tops and the, and the base gets stuck. So, so 13.0% ABV is alcohol by volume. So if the yeast eats all the sugar, as we think it will, uh, then you'll have that 13.0% alcohol. Wine is generally from eight and a half to about 17% alcohol. 17, really high, you get above that, you're into a fortified wine. In our case, we're making table wine. 13 is right in the middle, it's perfect. It's not too high of alcohol, so it burns your throat. And you're gonna be able to taste the characteristics of the grape. And this grape, the Cabernet Sauvignon, is uh, just unbelievable out of South Africa. Now that we know what the bricks is, we're going to start the fermentation process by adding some yeast and some enzymes and some amino acids. Before we do that, though, we're going to do a little chemistry. And it's not to scare you, but this is what you have to know when you're making wine. Every single grape contains the following. Glucose, fructose, lactose, malic acid, tartaric acid, amino acids, water, uh, pigeon dropping, seagull dropping, anything that flies over or crawls through a vineyard is going to, uh, it's, it's going to affect the soil and give that particular plot of land a certain characteristic. And that manifests itself into the wine. That's why certain areas of the world and certain vineyards put up better wine than others because of the characteristics of the soil and the weather and the altitude and the proximities to bodies of water. All that comes into play, so it's very complex, the whole winemaking process. But every single grape, now, I'm going to show you some formulae that are associated with these elements. You don't have to remember them, I just want you to see the recurrence of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in the winemaking process. Here's one of the acids, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in certain molecular combination. You don't have to remember it, but just know that it's there. It's all natural in grapes. Here's one of the sugars, glucose. Again, that's a, a fructose is a is an isomer above the uh, glucose, and it's again carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in certain combination. Now, I think most people would remember what H2 is, and I always ask people, anybody know what this is? And of course, it's hydrogen, H2. And if they know what that is. They certainly would know this. This is H2O. That's water. And Hydrogen sulfide. Now, hydrogen sulfide smells like rotten eggs. So we have to do something to mitigate the odor of hydrogen sulfide. It's part of the process. When you introduce the yeast, you're going to have hydrogen sulfide. And you don't want to open a bottle of wine and have it smell like rotten eggs. So to mitigate that, we use diammonium phosphate. However, in this case, we are using a yeast culture that doesn't produce any hydrogen sulfide. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. It just depends on where your grapes come from and what you want to do, what your predilection of, of how you want to go about the chemistry. In our case, for the South, uh, for the, uh, South African and for the Chilean, we use the uh, yeast that doesn't produce any hydrogen sulfide. Uh, here's another little formula here. I get that over here. K. K is not strikeout. It's potassium. We use potassium metabisulfite as an agent to mitigate any uh, off-smelling of, of, of particles or, or to, to keep it nice and clean uh, in, in, in the yeast. And, and it's, a, it's a whole different uh, thing. But potassium metabisulfite is uh, one of the most important elements in the winemaking process. You have to use it. Potassium chloride, that's a salt. Just like sodium chloride is a salt, but potassium chloride is also part of the process to the process. And here's K9E. Is that 
Now you hit, you hit it on the head. Dog pee. And there's no dog pee in here. But dogs do go through a vineyard and so it's going to affect the soil. And you have a lot of fun with that one particular one. But there's a segue here because this is sodium. And there's a lot of uh, sodium in the winemaking process, obviously. And this is sodium chloride, which is also a salt. Okay, so you've got potassium chloride and sodium chloride. And then you have DA, NA, take it twice. Banana. There's no compound. There's no compound like this, but it's a good segue because there's lots of sodium and lots of potassium in bananas. We have a lot of fun with that, by the way. Carbon dioxide, CO2. Now, carbon dioxide, again, is, is one of the things that forces all the skins to the surface of the must. And in order to keep the skins in contact with the juice to develop the color, we have to punch down every day, two or three times a day, you have to punch down the must to keep it in solution so you're developing the color. And carbon dioxide is one of those things. So during the course of the week of fermentation, you are welcome to come over here and punch your wine down. And you don't have to do it three or four times a day, but if you come over during the week, you would you just split it up with Monday group, and somebody comes in and on Monday, and another person comes in on Tuesday, and you know, and, and we have people that that are make wine with us. They come every single day and punch at the whole row. The reason why we do that is because that way, if you punch the whole row, everybody will get theirs done three or four or five times a day. That helps to develop the color and the flavor of the wine. Sulfur dioxide. Again, SO2 is part and parcel to the process. And fungi, yeast. Yeast is nothing more than fungi. What's the most uh, uh, well-known type of fungi? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. I saute mine in garlic and a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of shallots and drizzle it over a ribeye, medium rare. Try it sometime. I'll give you the recipe. We're making alcohol after all, and here is one of the alcohols, and this is ethanol. Again, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in certain molecular combination. So that's a little bit of the chemistry, and you know, it's not anything you have to really remember, but if you have a question on the chemistry of, of, of winemaking, please ask me because I'll be help, happy to help you understand what's going on. Now, having said that, what I have here is the combinations that we're going to use to turn your very, very delicious grape juice into wine. And what we have here is some yeast that I have pre-hydrated for about, oh, 15, 20 minutes. It's part of the protocol. And this yeast culture, again, does not produce any hydrogen sulfide. And it's, a, it's, it's fairly new in the last four or five years, and so we've experimented with it, and we like it, and so we continue to use it. So that, that minimizes us, for, it, it, it takes away from us having to add other chemicals. We don't want any interference, and we don't want to in, introduce anything that we don't have to in the winemaking process. So that's the good thing about the hydrogen sulfide uh, minimized by the yeast culture we're using. Now, this culture comes from the south of France, from the Bordeaux region, and from the Tuscany region in Italy. Originally, about uh, 200 years ago, we came from the Greek island of Samos, and it was recultured and recultured and recultured. This will withstand up to 17% alcohol without dying off. Some yeast cultures will only withstand 12 or 13 or 14% alcohol, and if you have a high alcohol uh, wine, you don't want to have a stuck fermentation because then you have to start all over again. And we have, you know, 5,000 people coming through here in, a, in a, any given year. And uh, two or three hundred people a day, and you have to fit them in if you had a stuck fermentation, so we don't do that. We're also adding uh, some amino acids, and this also minimizes problems that may have occurred during shipping. This, this particular, these grapes came in all the way from South Africa and from Chile, and they've been on a boat for two, no, it's two weeks, three weeks, who knows how long it took to get here, and then on a truck from East Coast to here, and we don't know what was in there. So we use this particular enzyme 
called endozyme to minimize any problems that may have occurred during the transportation. And last but not least is, these are time release tablets, and this is a whole series of vitamins that feed the yeast to give the yeast energy to let the yeast eat all the sugar and convert it into alcohol. And these, this minimizes us from having to uh, having to go in there every day and add something. And so you just we just put the uh, six of these tablets. Each one of them has a different uh, release factor uh, to it. And uh, it's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's a lot of vitamin B. If you want the truth. B. And so there's thiamine and niacin and lots of vitamins in there. So there's good good things in wine. That's why it's good for you. So we add that, and I'm going to show you just how we do that right now. Now it's simple because all you really do is you really do just this. You put it in here and you go all the way around, all the way around nice and foamy. <laughs> okay. And then when I see something like that, what I do is I take some of the endozyme and I swirl it around and put it in here and get that in there and get some more endozyme in there. And they actually have you do that. You usually throw them up in the air and it splashes all over the place because usually the whole group of you are around and you're looking in here real close and somebody has to put it in there. I don't put it in, you do. And it splashes all over you and that's why we have people not, uh, not come just for a cocktail party. So, now, having said that, during the uh, course of the week, obviously as I to told you about plunging, we're going to do that right now. I'm going to show you how to plunge properly. Now the most important thing is to remember you don't want to plunge so vigorously that you bang the bottom. It's not, not good for us. What you want to do is you want to gently uh, press the grapes down into the bottom and without splitting the seeds. And that causes bitterness, by the way, so you don't have that happen. So I'm going to show you how you do this now. Always, 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 before you plunge, you got to clean your shaft. I mean, it's very important in a winemaking process to keep your shaft nice and clean. So, you press down. Now, some people, if they're short in stature, as I am, you actually stand up on the, on the edge and you can press down, but I can uh, go ahead and do it without standing on the edge today. And I just caress the bottom. You don't want to bang the bottom. It's not good for you. So you go all the way around, and you get it nice and juicy. That's the idea. Get it nice and juicy. And this takes about a minute and 40 seconds. Uh, most guys know what that is. A minute and 40. That right, ladies? Yes, absolutely. So that's what we're doing now. Just caressing the bottom and I'm scraping ever so gently and I'm bringing the grapes that are on the bottom up into solution. Okay, and you do that by putting it on edge, and dragging it easily without banging it. And you don't want to split the seeds because that causes bitterness, as I said earlier. And go around. And that's all you do. And then when I'm all done, I just give it a little. Give it a little bang. And then when you're all finished plunging, you gotta clean your shaft once again. So you don't wanna have a sticky shaft. I mean it's not good for So this has to be done four or five times a day to develop color flavor and uh, to make sure that you have a vigorous fermentation because you want the sugar to be converted into alcohol and that's done by the yeast, the enzymes and the amino acids and at the end of the week now you're going to go into the barrel through the press and that's a whole other process and you'll, you'll have a lot of fun with that I'm sure. Do not wear a cocktail dress when you come to pressing part 
because believe me, it's a little bit messier than this. <laughs> That's the story. I have to edit that. So what we have here is, you can see it's very, very fresh parasitic water, parasitic acid solution in water, and a, cer a certain concentration that is going to maintain a certain sanitary element when we're when we're plunging this fermentation. Now, the most important thing is, as I've often said, is you're going to clean your shaft first. So we know it's already clean, but I like to do it because it's been sitting around. So clean the shaft. Squeeze it off. And you don't want to drip it all over the place. So. Now, one of the reasons why we plunge in the first place is to develop color. Because whether you know it or not, the juice of red grapes is clear. And take a a red grape, a red wine grape, and you squeeze it and you get it into your hand, you'll see that the juice is clear. So in order to develop the color, we have to keep the juice in contact with the skins because the color comes from the skins. So you can develop flavonoids, color, and uh, you make sure that you have an aggressive fermentation. So you can see, this is getting pretty, pretty loose. We're probably going to go into the uh, barrel here pretty soon with this particular cauldron. And the odors, as you plunge, you plunge very, very gently so that you don't split the seeds, causing bitterness. So you have to be gentle with it. This is romance, after all. This is not making uh, vodka or tequila. This is gentle. So all the way around, and then because there's the, there's the carbon dioxide that's engendered during the fermentation process forces the skins to the surface, but there are a few on the bottom, so we scrape it ever so gently, bring it up, and then a little bag and go over here. And you can see we're developing nice and color. And as the week of fermentation goes on, the solution gets looser and looser. We got a lot of wine in there now. It's not that thick cap that we had to press down and almost stand up in between two to fit through the cap. Well, now we're right near the end. This is getting ready to go in the bag. So it's probably a couple of days away. Now that we've got this all nice and sweet, we get a little bag. important. Clean your shaft. You don't want a dirty, sticky shaft lying around the wine. There we go. And that's how you develop color, flavor, and uh, all the intensities that you need to, to make good wine. And this is done in very, very large quantities in big commercial wineries. Here we do things one barrel at a time. Every one of these barrels is sacrosanct. This happens to be a Malbec Merlot uh, a blend with a little Carmenere in there. And this is going to be really nice because, number one, it's from the Southern Hemisphere. It has a little different nuances because of its location, its proximity to, to the body of water, the South Pacific, and in that case, and uh, the minerality that comes from the volcanic activity in Chile. It's amazing how that affects the soil, giving a certain characteristic to the grape variety. And this will be really kind of nice because you've got Malbec, famous down there in Chile, as it is in Argentina, Merlot, and Carmenera, another great, great grape uh, from Chile. I can't wait to taste that particular blend myself. Uh, let's see what we have here. We have a Carmenere, Cabernet Sauvignon, and a Cabernet Franc. And uh, three great grapes, all from Chile. 
file autos got this. I can see that we already started with me. <laughs> now this one has an entirely different characteristic. And the old factory emanation is entirely different from the one that we just plunged. This is obviously the common era comes through more prominently in this one than it did in this one because there's only 5% of the common era in the one we just did. This one, we got uh, about 80% uh, common era, so it's mostly that grape that used to be part of the Bordeaux blend. The, the, one of the five grapes that were allowed to be part of the Bordeaux blend. It went out of favor in the 1800s, found its way down to uh, Chile, where they thought it was Merlot for many years. And then Dr. Meredith at University of California, Davis, did a DNA analysis recently, because DNA, you make a DNA analysis on everything now, your earlobe, your derriere, your eyeballs. <laughs> anyway, she determined that there's something about this when she tasted the grapes, that they were different, and they were supposed to all be Merlot. Did a DNA analysis and found out, no, it's the long lost common era that used to be part of the Bordeaux blend and made, made uh, Chile famous, absolutely. Uh, so let's see what this one is. Right. So give another little wipe just in case anybody came by. And now we can see, I go down very so gently, and I can tell we're getting close now to uh, going into the barrel. And as we come up, and gently now, because it's so loose, you don't have to bang through it. The cap used to be this thick, and you used to have to really get through it. Now it's all loose because the yeast has eaten all the sugar, converted it to alcohol. There's less carbon dioxide being developed, so you don't have a big, big, big cap. So you've got a distribution of the grapes throughout the liquid. They're not, it's not a whole big thick cap. But there's grapes on the bottom because the less CO2 means gravity is going to have you force the skins to the bottom and you want them to get into the blend because there's a lot of flavor and a lot of uh, color. We're developing flavor and color. Commercial operation, they press a button and it pumps over itself four or five times a day. It's automated. But they were doing this classical style where you do everything. You learn how to develop the flavors and the colors. That's the difference between a commercial house and a home wine maker or uh, the way we do it here is great expectation. Well, I'm being very gentle with it. I'm really like I'm going around and mixing the top part. And I don't want to bang it on the bottom. Because that would cause bitterness. Which you don't want. And then, again, give it a little bang. Now, this water will be water and uh, Parasitic acid solution will we'll change it maybe four or five times during the day as it loses its uh, protective elements. So it'll take on the color of the skin. So this proves you saw that this was clear. You saw that now just coming out after just two, it's taken on the color of the grape skins. So that's the proof of the pudding. And that's how your wine is developed the color of your wine. Hey guys, it's Mike with Grape Expectations. Um, sorry you're not here today with us, but we're going to be pressing and showing you what pressing is all about today. Um, so this is the 756 pounds of grapes that was crushed and fermented over the last week. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna be putting your wine into the barrel. So what we'll do first is we're going to pump as much free flow juice and or wine at this point, directly out of this fermentation vat into the barrel, which is right here behind me. We're going to use a couple strainer baskets to keep the skins and the seeds out. Once we can't pump, we're going to pump down until we can't pump anymore. Once that happens, we're going to actually scoop all of the must into the press behind you there. Um, 
And at that point, we're going to go ahead and press out the rest of the juice. The wine, excuse me. It is wine this time at this point. 98% of the fermentation is complete. So, can I get three volunteers, please, and we'll get started? Strainer baskets, one, two, three. Fourth one can be the pumper. Bernsey, you want to pump? Sure. You're on call, either one. There you go. These baskets are going to keep all the seeds and skins out of the barrel. Going right into the barrel. Good flow. Good flow today. <laughs> so we're gonna fill the barrel to where it's almost full. We're gonna leave a little space at the top. Like I said, 98% of fermentation is complete. We want to leave a little bit of room for expansion at this point for that last little bit of fermentation that we'll finish out over the next couple weeks. Um, it's producing CO2, so we need, need to leave room for expansion. So as you can see in the tub, we've pumped out all of the free flow wine. So now what's left is just uh, the must here. So we're going to scoop it into the press. You see the guys doing it now. Once we get it full, we're going to go ahead and put the blocks in there. And we're going to press the rest of it out. This is the fun part. It's a little bit messy. With this paddle right here, let me see this real quick. Yeah. Is we're just trying to smooth it out a little, and we're also just trying to get a little extra juice out of here before we block it up. That way, it, it helps press it. It helps press it. Okay. So Chad's gonna hand me. We have the half moons here. Put these in, in here in the press. Yeah. Now 
we're going to take these blocks. I'm going to block it up. Thank you, Chad. Chad's my helper over here to my right. Everyone say hi to Chad. Hi, Chad. <laughs> Big game of Jenga. starts to put pressure on the blocks. And you can see it's going to start squeezing out to the edge of the press. Okay guys, this is what's left of your 756 pounds of grapes. We call it the cake. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to cut the cake. We're going to take it, put it in these bins. Normally we would send it to um, a local composting company, but this year we have a uh, group of master gardeners that are going to come and take all of the skins and they're going to use it for compost. So it goes to good use and it doesn't get thrown away. So basically you cut it just like a pie. The goal is to get it in the tub and keep it off the floor. Good luck, huh? Here we are. So not much left. 756 pounds of grapes. We got the good stuff out of it. Starts out with about 750 something and ends up about 160 something. Yeah, that's probably a safe guess. Or 120 something. I can do math. So, this tank here, we call it top off. 
pop-off wine. We collect it once we fill the barrel, as full as we're gonna fill the barrel today. We collect the rest of the wine and it goes into the stainless steel container. We label it top off. And basically what we use this wine for is for topping the barrels throughout the process. The first real time that we use this is at racking when we remove the sediment out of the barrel. Um, we would need to replace that with some volume of wine. This is the wine we use. This wine gets treated just like your wine. And once this tank's full, we're going to pump it into a barrel, and it gets barrel aged just like your wine. However, it is a slight blend. So whatever grapes we're pressing today goes into this. It is a blend, and then we use it for topping and or as well throughout the process, evaporation. Anytime we need to top the barrels, this is the wine we use. Hi right, guys, who knows what this is called? Anyone? Anyone? All right, usually I get all kinds of fun answers. It's called a bung. This is a special bung, and not just because I'm holding it. This is called a fermentation bung. You'll notice there's a little relief valve on it. So as fermentation finishes up, if there's any CO2 that builds up in the barrel, it allows it to release. So once fermentation's done, we can push the nipple down, and it becomes a permanent bung. So since you're not here, I'm going to put your bung in your bung hole. Pull the nipple so that it can breathe. And there you go. Hi, Great Backs again. Just wanted to uh, kind of wrap up your virtual winemaking experience here for the Crush and Press for the South African and Chilean season. First off, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, we appreciate you guys being patient and understanding that we weren't able to bring the groups in. Um, we missed you guys, we wish you were here, but uh, thanks for understanding. So hopefully you've enjoyed the videos. Um, also, the next step of the process is going to be racking. That will be in the fall. Uh, it happens at the end of October, beginning of November. Um, we fully anticipate by then you guys will be able to come in back in, we'll be able to get a hangout again, and you'll be able to participate in the racking. Um, other than that, a uh, quick announcement on the, the Bacchus Awards. Uh, August 8th is still on. Um, we will definitely keep everyone posted if there's any changes. Um, other than that, we hope to see everyone in the fall and uh, have a great summer. Thanks again.